<laughs> Hello, everybody. We are back. Um, this is Speaking of Spirits. I'm Colleen here with my co-host. Dirty Birdie. Dirty Birdie. Yeah. Yep. So... The um, secret government agent, I age, guess. Yeah, the secret government agent. I just love that. <laughs> so, um, if if you if you don't know what that reference is, go back and watch Nightmare Road, uh, the episode on spirit photography. We we uncovered Dirty Bird is a secret agent. So, <laughs> the the list has now been compromised. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to change my name again. Again, we're gonna have to come up with another one and move you. You know, just kind of move you and shuffle you around the U.S. Yeah. Um, so we are. This is a really interesting topic that we have today, uh, and I had to do some research on it because I um I had heard about it, but not. I, I really had to dig into it. So this is called cross correspondence, and. So it it means it describes a phenomenon that emerged early in the 20th century and is connected to automatic writing. So automatic writing is you know what that is, right, Dirty Bird? Uh uh no, not really. Okay. I mean I heard about it, I didn't look too much into it. Yeah. So automatic writing is kind of like a form of meditation where you're connecting with um uh, it's the spirit world and you use a pen and a paper and as your mind, as you start meditating and just kind of freeing up your mind or thinking about somebody you want to connect with. But a lot of time it happens when you're just trying to meditate and, and let your mind go. Um, you can draw stuff or you write sentences and phrases or names or something like that. It comes, it's supposed to come through you. So they're channeling through you. Okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So some people would call that a form of possession, but it really isn't. It's it's a you're channeling to allow oh. something to come through you for a for a moment. Okay. So So like a conduit. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what it does is um it's a practice in which a person writing in a state of semi trance may obtain scripts like phrases and words um that are originating what they say apparently from the unconscious mind so you're not consciously thinking about um the word dirty bird it comes through you and you write it down so it's not it's not supposed to be a conscious act um so and, and i want to give a lot of kudos to this this article here um that i am using primarily for for the the information um for this um this is a, a, an article that was written and if you are not familiar with this group uh you should be if you're into the paranormal it, it they're really a, a wealth of information it's called the um um now i'm going to say what's it called it's uh the society for cyclical research yep. and they're in england and um, you can subscribe to them and get their literature there. And, and they've done a, just a gosh, they've been around for a very long time. And they've um, I believe this article is from Trevor Hamilton and th this this the society. So SPR, um, they've done a tremendous amount of studies. On this, I think there's something like in the order of 3,000 different research articles related to this. And it stemmed from basically, um, there was a gentleman who, who, before he passed away, he had, he was very involved in the paranormal. And this was uh, da -da -da -da, back in the 1901, okay? His name was Frederick Myers, and he was a co-founder for the Society for Psychical Research. And before he passed away, he had told one of his very good friends named Margaret Verrill, if I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. Um, she was a lecturer at Cambridge University, and she was involved in a lot of this paranormal world. And before he died, he had told her that... Um, 
he was going to send her messages after death. Okay. So <clears throat> um, the aim was that if he survived the dying of his body, we would know, like people would know that he was still alive in the afterlife. Right. Okay. Um, and, and mentally aware because he's going to be able to send these people messages. So there about two years later, um, Veryl's daughter, Helen, um, also involved in all of this stuff thought, well, let's, let's try this automatic writing. Right. And so they, um, there was another woman who was in India at the time. And so all these gals, um, corresponded with each other. They knew each other. Well, obviously the two are mother and daughter, but, um, they thought, well, let's, let's give this a try. And so as the 1906, I think, um, between 1901, when he died or, or sometime after when he developed the Institute 1901, um, and, and when Frederick was Frederick, right? Um, when he died, let me get back. Frederick Myers. When Frederick Myers died, they started this. They started this automatic writing, and they kind of dismissed a lot of it until some researchers started looking really, really closely and said, "No, wait a minute, something's going on here." Because all of you people, without being able to, I mean, you know, this is 1906, so we don't have a whole lot of technology out there. We have some, but not a lot. And they said, without you being able to correspond with each other and on different times, you guys are writing basically the same information to connect the dots. So they were dismissive because like the word um, yellow would come through on an automatic writing one night. Well, then the gal in India would have a sentence around the word yellow. And then Margaret's daughter would write another part of the sentence. And they started putting this together and they were actual messages when you started connecting the dots. Okay. So there's like puzzle pieces except yeah. all over the world. Yeah. And they're like, I got this. So I got this. What did you get? And then they stitched it all together to become a sentence. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's, that's yeah, interesting. I mean, or like a paragraph. Some people would get a whole sentence. So, um, and it was when um, a research officer named Alice Johnson with SPR. So she was digging through all of these documents and, and she saw, like you said, this jigsaw puzzle emerge. So these were actual phrases and messages. And the, and what was really interesting was that um, the Alice Johnson argued that this could only be achieved by the influence of a single person. So Frederick, okay. Um, in this instance, it would be like Frederick. He's sending messages to the whole group, but not all of them are getting the whole message. They're getting bits and pieces, but when you put it together, it's a whole message. So maybe, maybe the gal in India was maybe meditating a little deeper. So her message was a little longer and the gal, you know what I mean? But when they started putting together, so all of this, these messages, um, they had, I guess they'd given all of this correspondence to SPR and then nobody really thought anything of it until Alice started putting these pieces together and went, Oh my God, look at this. So, um, there were other authors of the scripts. So I don't think it was just these three people. It was like people that Frederick knew all over the place were getting these messages and, um, some of them were getting messages in languages they didn't know, but they were writing it down. But Frederick knew the languages. So, okay. yeah. So, like, it would be like me writing Latin. I don't know Latin, but I would write a phrase in Latin, and it didn't mean anything to me. It's garbage. But when they, when these these researchers looked at it, well, they said, well, Frederick knew Latin, and this is this is what this phrase is. Okay. Why would you use Latin? I think he wanted to think about it this way. If he's, if he's sending, I think it was a good like control measure. So if, if, if he's corresponding with everybody in English. Okay. Then yeah. they thought maybe they were communicating. Yeah. That, that would definitely make a lot of people skeptical. So he's like, well, I know Latin. I'll 
toss it out there. So I'm going to write it down because nobody knows. Yeah. And then, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's, that makes sense. It's more of a control method then. Yeah. So what they thought was they asserted that a single theme distributed between various autumn automatists is what they call it, but it's, you know, automatic writing pe people who do in this, none of them knew what the others were writing could prove that a single independent mind or group of minds was behind the whole phenomenon. So putting the pieces of the jigsaw together. Okay. And one of the other things that was really quite interesting was um, some of these people who were doing automatic writing were writing um, in Greek, Greek, like, Oh, geez. And so, and they're like, well, we don't know what this means. Well, when, when they put it all together with the other people, they said, Oh, well, it's part of a sentence. Okay. Um, so, let, so example, so here's some examples on August 6, 1906, Alice Fleming was at her home in India and she wrote the words in automatic script, yellow, Y-E-L-O, and then yellow ivory right behind it. Well, it didn't really mean anything to her, but that's what she got. Two days later on August 8th, Margaret Verrill, who was in her home in Cambridge, wrote, I have done it tonight. Yellow is the written word. Say only yellow. Okay. Okay. And then um, there was another, there's, there's more. So... Margaret Verrill, who's in Cambridge in Britain, wrote on April 29th, warmed both hands before the fire of life. It fades and I'm ready to depart. And then she also drew the Greek letter um, Delta. Okay. Looks like an eight. Okay. okay. Then she wrote in Latin, give lilies with full hands. And then in English, come away, come away. And again, in Latin, the words pale death. So all these phrases are coming. And then she wrote, you finally got the word plainly written all along in your own writing. Look back. So these are messages coming through. So okay. the last state, that last sentence seems to be instruction, right? Look back. Look back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, the lilies with the full hands. Um, that's usually associated, I think. I could be wrong. Um, that's usually associated with... Uh, death like at a funeral lilies represent yeah. re oh, resurrection right. so the lilies like in the casket they're holding the lilies in their yeah. in their hand yeah. all hands right and lilies also represent uh re the resurrection that's why you see lilies for sale a lot during easter oh yeah yeah right easter lily. yeah okay okay so the, so there was this, I guess this person named Piddington started looking for all of these connections. And this gal in Boston, now we have another connection in Boston, Leon, Leonora Piper, um, was in a trance doing this automatic writing. And out of, when she was coming out of the trance, she doesn't know what it means, but she says the word, I think it's Thanos. Yep. Thanatos. 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 But she's like, I'm compelled to say this word, but she didn't know what it means, right? But and then at the same time, in in India, they're reading um the gal in India is writing Maurice Morris M O R S, and with that the shadow of death fell on his limbs. So as Piddington is starting to research all this and trying to figure out, okay, what does Thanatos mean? He okay, oh, it is the ancient Greek word for death. Uh, I came across something when I was looking, and Thanatos is the ancient Greek god of death. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here this guy has been talking about death to all these people, and they started connecting the dots, and it's like, okay, that makes sense. So the point is, and we have a ton of more examples that we can go through, but. Um, This automatic writing, so I have a little story, and I think I told it before, but it it's interesting. I haven't really spent a lot of time doing it because I can't get my mind loose, like shut down enough to do it. I'm always 
working on the next podcast, the next topic. We're always I'm doing something, right? Yeah. My dad, though, he was really good at meditating, and he wasn't meditating in the yoga pose mm, thing. You know, he'd take a bucket of his beer out with his dogs in the forest, sit in the sun, and just relax. And he was, he was, um, so he was the Pink Panther cartoonist and he did a lot of pen and ink. And a lot of times that's where he would draw. He would, he would take his big sketch pad and he would just draw whatever came to his mind. And a lot of those prints sold quite a bit because they were beautiful. You know, it's like his work was freer and easier, like an aircraft flying through the trees or so. I, you know what I mean? It was just neat. So he he was clearing a little spot on his land and he lived in the pretty thick forest. He was clearing a little spot because from his living room window, you could see um, Mount Lassen and he wanted a clearer view of, of the volcano. And so they had dropped some trees and he, and he was not a lot, but it was a nice little clearing. And then he built this really cool little, um, little, like a garden shed. I don't know what he used it for. He just built it because he felt like he wanted to build it. Well, when he got done building it, it was really cute. And it looked like a little, like a miner's hut, miner's shack. You know, it was really kind of a neat little structure. And so one day he's sitting out there with all the dogs and he's, you know, drinking his beer and he's flipping potato chips to the dogs. He's got a sketch pad. And he said he started kind of dozing in the sunlight. And when he woke up, he had drawn the little shack and a name and a date. And he thought, well, that's interesting. When he woke up, he didn't remember doing any of that, right? So he looks at the name and the date. And he can't put it together. So he's telling one of his buddies in town. Well, in town, we still had a, uh, have a, a gold assay office because there's still a lot of gold mining up there. So you can bring in gold that you find and they'll pay you for it. It's, they weigh it and give you the market value. And um, so he thought the guy he talks to his buddy at the assay office and this guy said, you know, I'm wondering if could that have been somebody who had a gold claim on your property? Because it's all gold mining country. And he goes, well, I don't know. I have no idea. How would I search that? Well, it took him a couple of years to, to figure it out. And sure enough, that guy had a mining claim just downhill in the creek. Oh, wow. That is. That is super interesting. Yeah. So he, yeah, that sounds like he uh, went into a meditative state and Mr. Miner was just like, hey, you're on my property. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do anything malicious, but he's just like, I'm here. This is my old property. Yeah. So I think that that's, that's what this automatic writing is all about. So this miner this gentleman who had worked this claim was trying to send a message out to my dad my dad somehow connected with him in this phase of meditation and somehow those two minds connected and the miner was able to have my dad write his name and date yeah but he also didn't he uh, yeah he also drew the little shack out there yeah maybe he was just like thanks for the shack i needed it could be so, oh yeah right so what that shack then it represented to my dad was this this connection to the history of the land and my dad when he was clearing the land in the shack he would put so because gold and quartz run hand in hand so when you find a quartz vein in gold country you're going to find a, a, a gold vein that's just the the way the veins work and um my dad had beautiful walls built all around his property with these gigantic quartz rocks and most of them were not just the white milky quartz they were the glassy quartz they were gorgeous and so there's so much quartz up there you know that there's gold and so that you know he was he never found any gold on his property but the quartz veins were there and they were strong and if they came loose he would just pile them and it eventually made walls retaining walls out of this stuff wow. yeah hmm. so he found, as he was clearing this area, he found that he was finding, like, old, old hinges and old, um, they weren't horseshoes, they were mule shoes, because mules and donkeys have different shaped hooves than a horse. They're very narrow and long. So he was finding mule shoes out there, old um, 
um, old nails, the very square nails that they used to use to build stuff, um, hinges, all kinds of stuff. And so that went into the shack. He put all that stuff back into the shack when he built it. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like he did have um, maybe a little cabin or, you know, a shack with some, like a small corral or something like that, that wasted away. Yep. And then for some reason, your dad was compelled to build another one. And that maybe uh, the miner was just like, was just like, hey, thanks for the new shack. So right. uh, I'm going to yeah. tell you thanks by having you draw it. And then I'm going to give you my name and date. Yeah, I you. know. It was, it was fascinating because I he never told me this happened until one day I had one of his sketchbooks and I was on his property and I was sitting out there sketching and I'm flipping through it. And I'm like, hey, dad, what is this? This is really cool. What is this? And he told me the story. I'm like, why didn't you call me and tell me the date this happened? This is so cool. Yeah, you know, my dad always just sleeps so well, it was, you know, it's pretty yeah, it was pretty cool. So let's get into um there's this John Piddington that I mentioned before. What a name. Um yeah. Piddington. Piddington. It's like Paddington Bear, right? So he was working with the medium Lenora Piper. And in nineteen oh six, she was so Lenora was invited to England to work with John Piddington to see if she could contribute to the cross correspondence phenomena. Okay. Because now she's a medium, not necessarily an automist, right? Automat, autom, automist, anyway, um, automatic writing person, um, automatist, automatist. It's really hard for me to say that. Um, so she goes over to England and when she, um, this Piper lady, when she goes into her trance, Piddington engaged in a conversation with, so when, Pitt, when Piper would go into a trance, she had this person named Rector who acted as her in-between. So she had given this person a name. So she, she's a medium. She calls on Rector to come forward and then to correspond with, with, um, for, Franklin. Franklin, right? God, I, I'm so bad with names. Wasn't he the guy? Frederick. Frederick Myers. God, that's how bad I am. I can lose it in two seconds. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. So she has a go-between name rector. So when John Piddington is talking to Lenora when she's in a trance, he's actually talking with rector, and he asks rector to bring forward some messages. And this gal, Piper, writes a message in Latin and it's meaningless to her when she comes out of the trance because she doesn't know Latin. Okay. And she asked, um, Myers, who's dead to relay this phrase back to Margaret Verrill. Remember she was the one that pipe that, um, he initially said, I want to talk to you this way at when I die. So he, Piddington asked during the trance, Frederick, hey, relay the message that you just gave us back to Margaret Verrill. We want to see if you can do that. Okay. So now the message is going to be written out twice. And, okay. um, and they, the script, so the, the script from Verrill and um, Piper are almost the same. and. It says justice holds the scales that gives the words, but an anagram would be better. Tell him that rat, star, tars, and so on. Try this. It has been tried before. So he gave them letters, but they're mixed up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah anagram. It's an anagram. But so it's either um, tears or stare, what they came up with. And um, so they both got kind of the same message. And then again, they get another message that says, Aster, Latin for star, Terrace, Greek for sign, and also an anagram for star. That's so Margaret gets this message and Piper getting this message. So it's basically the same message saying the same thing, just written a little bit differently. And they're like, wow, that worked. So it works. So Piper going into a trance and this 
other living person, Pittington, was able to talk to Frederick Myers and say, okay, we've gotten this message, now send the same message to Margaret. And it's not word for word the same, but it's very, very close. It's the same in concept. That is, that is super interesting. Huh. Yeah, I'm fascinated by this. Um, there's just a ton, like I said, there's like 3,000 different research articles on this cross-correspondence. And I think it would be really interesting um, if anybody out there watching this has has had anything like this happen. That would be interesting. What I found interesting is that you have three people in three different parts of the world communicating with this gentleman who passed away. And yeah. they're coming up with text that feeds each, each other. Yep. Yeah, so they're all getting kind of sort of the same message, but they're not. So they have to they have to communicate with the, each other to figure out what the sentence actually is. And like, jigsaw puzzle, essentially. It is. It is. Um, yeah, and then he wrote a lot on... Um, he would just give them clues to start seeking things out and, and they would find the clues and they would, they would, you know, just in different writings, like in different books and all kinds of stuff like that. Oh, so this oh. oh yeah. That sounds like the, uh, this is off topic and it's going to be a, a, a different topic later on, but that sounds like Cicada, Cicada 3301. Have you heard about that? No, it was a, it was an internet scavenger hunt that people put out and people, you know, for real smart, real smart people, uh, computer wise. And they would have to go out and search out these clues on the internet. And when they figured it out, they would give them another clue, another clue from a book or a piece of music or really, really obscure references. So Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of sounds like what he's doing. He's just like, okay, well. And of course, there's a lot of criticism about a lot of this stuff. Um, some people say um, that the people doing this, spiritualists convinced of survival, found it elitist and overcomplex and inferior to the best evidence provided by certain mental and physical mediums. I'm like, I don't understand. I don't even understand what they're trying to say here. These women are elitists because they're all of a sudden they're getting these messages in a trance. I don't understand that. Um, I don't, these gals didn't ask to have this happen. They just, once when Frederick had told Margaret first, he goes, I want to try this when I die. And then he dies and she's like, okay, well let's, let's give it this go. You know, let's see what happens. So she and her daughter start. And then this other lady over and, and um, um, she starts, I mean, it's just all over the world. So they started putting these pieces together. I don't understand. Um, some people are saying that these people were um, in co co cohorts with each other. What do you say? Like cons conspiring. Cahoots. Co cahoots. Cahoots. Yeah. Cahoots with each other. They're conspiring. And somehow they were in communication before all this happened. And um, you got to remember the time frame. I don't know how. I guess you could get, what, 1906. Telegram would phones were phones weren't out there in every house. No, no, it would probably more than more than likely it would be letters and telegram. Letters and telegram, and and these gals were coming up with the same phraseology on three different continents within days of each other. So yeah. unless they were getting tele, they were sending instant telegrams to each other. Then there is no way for them to do this, right? Uh, no. I'm trying to think. I don't. I could be. I could be way wrong, but I don't think they had international telegrams back then. I yeah, could be I way wrong. Right, so, like our telegram, when we used to send telegrams, it would stay in the United States, but it wouldn't go overseas. I could be way wrong. Oh, kitty! Let me look. Um, give me a second. I got to put my cat upstairs. <laughs> Let's see. Come on, mother. 
I am looking to see when the first telegram <laughs> first first bloody 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 boo. <laughs> okay. The first international telegraph conference was first March 1, 1965, but so it was the first Yeah, you know, they may have 1844 they laid a, a trans uh, a line I guess through the ocean. So I, I'm not sure. Anyway, it, it's pretty interesting to me that unless these gals were really working to be um, cohorts, cahoots, cahoots with each other in cahoots with each other, then I, I would tend to think this is somewhat legit. This is legitimate. And then when the gal goes into the trance and what she writes down, and unless they then called Margaret somehow, and told her what to write down. I don't know. Yeah, I, know. I don't think that's possible. Um, like, like I said, I could be way wrong. Yeah, I think probably they did have transatlantic or all of these different. They probably did have telegraphs back then, but I, I don't know. Um, I just I would be curious to know what what listeners think. You know. I do know that automatic writing is a skill, and like I said, in my dad's case, it was proven to be correct information, but I don't know um, if people have tried it. I, I encourage people to try stuff like that, because especially with your relatives, right? Because you might get mm -hmm. information you may not have otherwise known, and I think it's pretty cool, but... But that's yeah. automatic writing. This This is cross-correspondence, so this is many people putting getting phrases and putting it all together yeah that's super interesting yeah yeah and it's not yeah the it, it's the same message but a little different it is interesting to me um yeah it's not like one of them just got like a a, a completely different message yeah so yeah yeah hmm. yeah Things that make you go, hmm. Yep. There's so much in this world we don't understand. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun to look at stuff you don't understand. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I don't think a lot of this is coincidence. Margaret gets the word yellow, the other lady gets a sentence with the word yellow. I mean, I think this is I think it's interesting. I'm really glad that this um S SPR um group is out there. They're still out there, by the way. Um, yeah, wasn't that the group that investigated that really haunted house in England? The same people. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, oh, wait a minute. That one, the infield poltergeist. Yeah, the infield poltergeist. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're right. I think they did send somebody over there. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they're still around. They do a lot of really amazing work, and um, I think it's some some group. I'm. I think I'm gonna go ahead and and join you know you could you can join um so that you can get access to all of their literature and their back reference documents and everything like that because i think they probably have an incredible amount of information that would be oh. really interesting to read yeah that'd be fun to look through yeah yeah so um if you are in england and you and you know about them you can go to their actual building and rent books um uh, and some books are available. They will mail them like you can check them out. And you can mail them. They'll mail them to you and then um, you have to send them back kind of thing. But um, they also do have a lot of their stuff that's now electronic They're, that they've probably scanned and is now electronic. And so I think, yeah, look them up. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to look them up. See if I can't find something online. Yeah, I just can't find like the English price for uh joining the group you know to subscribe i have to figure that out but it's all in pounds but I'm, i just have to convert the pounds to dollars and go from there i guess oh yeah that's simple yeah so but i don't yeah anyway well i think i think this was an interesting topic i hadn't really heard about it so let us know what you feel and shoot us an email with topics if you guys if there's something you want us to look into um you can use our facebook 
at Pocatello Paranormal Research. Send us a message that way. Um, you can send us a message on um, at Colleen at Pocatello Paranormal Research. Um, that there's yeah. various ways to get hold of us. Yeah, we have a Discord if, for the oh, younger Discord. folks. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I've never been on it yet. That tells you how old I am. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining in. Until uh, next week. All right. Bye, everybody.